Can you sell a Pico 8 game? The answer to that question is no. Yes. Maybe? It's complicated. Let's look at the data. Welcome everybody, welcome to LaserDesk Academy, welcome to this new video where today we are going to be tackling a very important question that a lot of newcomers are asking where they're coming into the Pico 8 community. They are asking whether you can actually sell Pico 8 games. Generally it's a bit of an awkward question, every time this question gets asked there is a bit of an internal eye rolling happening, like not, not this again, you know. Because on the one hand it's a little bit of tone deaf, you know, there's, there's a bit of a... It goes a bit of against the grain of the PQ8 community. We are all about sharing and learning from each other and uh, not really about, you know, making big bucks. But also it's a bit awkward, I think, because it's really hard to tell. We don't really, we can't really tell if it's possible to sell a PQ8 game. And actually it's a bit of a layered question. There's a lot of layers here that need to unpack in order to answer this properly. So for example, like, Generally, the very obvious answer to this question is just yes, of course you can sell a PQ8 game. There is no problem. Like I've shown in my recent Itch.io video, you can just export your PQ8 game as a binary file. You can just upload it to Itch.io and just set a selling price and then just you go. You're selling your PQ8 game. Job's done. But of course, that's not necessarily what people mean when they ask if it's possible. They don't want to know if it's technically possible. They want to know if it's, you know, if it's viable, if you can make you know, any significant amount of money doing this if you can be successful selling PQ8 games. All right, so here's what I did. I basically, I searched out on Itch.io. I searched for games tagged with PQ8, which resulted in a lot of PQ8 games, and then filtered them for the paid games. And then I contacted each one of the devs of those games and just asked them for the sales numbers. I contacted a total of 34 developers, 28 responded to me and contributed their data and this resulted in this beautiful database of 80 games that are being sold on Itch.io that may or may not be related with PQ8. Oh, I, I guess I, I, you want me to digest this data? <laughs> But before we do, one quick important disclaimer. Putting a price on a game is obviously a business decision, but it can be also seen as a moral decision. It can be a way to establish value, to say, this is my work and it's worth something. And in practice, it might be difficult to disentangle the two. It might be easy to forget that these two are not the same. It's easy, very easy to slip into this mindset where you look at a game that is not selling very well and to immediately conclude, ah, this is a worthless game. And even worse, as a developer, it's easy to convince yourself that your work is worth nothing if it didn't perform on this marketplace and that you as a developer are worthless as a consequence. If you watch my We Are All Beginners video, you probably already guess what my stance is on the situation. So please remember that there are real people behind those numbers, that there are real people doing hard work. We are not measuring whether they work has any value. I think this is established beyond any doubt. We are just looking at how their games manage to trade on this one marketplace, okay? I know it's difficult, but we are going to try. All right, so let us jump straight in. I have created a series of graphs which let us look at the data and kind of like try to understand what is happening here. Those graphs are all interactive and they are web-based and links to those uh, graphs will be down at doobly-doo so you can check them out yourself and explore the data set. This first graph is a very simple one. It's a bar graph showing us how much money the individual Pico 8 games made over their lifetime. The vertical axis is obviously money. And you can see that we have like a very common shape that you see in a lot of situations where things are being sold on the internet, where you have a large spike where very, very few people are making a lot of money. And then we have the long tail, a large amount of bars that are very, very small, meaning that there's a large amount of projects that do not get off the ground. And in fact, in our case, there's a bunch of dots uh, over here, down here. These are games that made zero money. But let's look at the spike. And if you look at the spike here, we see um, that, you know, the most successful Pico 8 game on Itch.io in this database is Poom, obviously. Poom by Frederick Sucho and Paranoid Cactus, a uh, Doom remake in uh, Pico 8, which obviously was is a technical marvel, and I'm not surprised to see it on top of the list. It made $640. Yeah. 
The second most successful game in this data set is Pushamo by Brook. Uh, it's a puzzle game, kind of like a mixture of Sokoban and Tetris to some extent. You're pushing blocks around and the blocks are kind of like Tetris-like and they disappear. It's, it's awesome. You should check it out. Actually, I'm a little bit surprised that it is so high up this list that it is on second place, the second most successful game on this database. And I think it might be actually the key to understand a lot of the things that are happening here. So keep an eye out for Pushamo as we go through the data. For now, let's just note Pushamo made $480, $482. Closely followed by the third most successful entry, which is a Pixel Sessions Volume 1 by Tresvel Dog with a revenue of $464. This is the one I'm not too surprised about. It's an older experiment to sell Pico 8 games, a very, very prominent one. It's been around the block for a while. And yeah, I've seen it around and I was actually curious to see what the numbers are behind this one. It's good to have this one here. The fourth entry is an anonymous developer with an anonymous game with $292. Some of the developers chose to be anonymous and that should be respected. And then further down the line on the fifth place, we have Explorers from also from Crasswall Dog with $270. And then as the slope evens out, we have Brendan Keogh's Putting Challenge with $149 and so forth. And you know, you can go through this list on your own and explore exactly, you know, where the games that you're familiar with or not familiar with are on this list. Now let us put these numbers that we see here, let us put those into perspective. And for that, I have like this feature here where you can turn on some thresholds. So you can see this, these lines and you can see how many games reached an individual threshold. Let's just scroll all the way up here and see, all right, around $4,500 is the average salary for an average programmer in Germany if they are supposed to work on something for 100 hours. 100 hours is a kind of like a number I like to work with when talking about Pico 8 games. It's how much it took me to develop uh, my chance sweet buns because I live streamed the entire thing so I can tell exactly how much time I needed. It's a nice round number and it works out as a rough estimate, as a rough budget for how long it takes to develop a Pico 8 game. As you can see, we are very, very far away for an average programmer salary from Germany. By the way, uh, I took the salary from some kind of website. I'm not exactly sure if this is true. I'm just, you know, Googled average salary Germany. Pfft. If we scroll down a little bit, we get the minimum wage in Germany, which is a little bit over $1,000. Again, minimum wage for 100 hours of work. And yeah, even the most successful games have not even, like, have hardly reached half of that. So yeah, nobody actually even made minimum wage selling Pico 8 games. Scrolling further down, there's another threshold, which is um, you know, an average programmer in Germany when they work for 10 hours. That's because when I asked developers how long it took them to develop their games, Tom Brinton was a bit of an outlier. Most people said around a month, which works well with the 100 hour estimate I was working with. But Tom, Tom is built different. Tom just said straight 10 hours. And I said like, really? And he said like, okay, maybe 12 hours. <laughs> Tom is not fooling around. It has to be done in a weekend. <laughs> okay, so I introduced this threshold just for Tom to see, you know, maybe some of us are able to develop their Pico 8 games faster, in which case, you know, the equation becomes more favorable for them. But as you can see, even if you bring down the threshold, you can see that Tom is still very, very far away of reaching his own threshold. Now, the next threshold we see uh, is minimum wage in Brazil monthly. So yeah, some of the developers I interviewed are actually from different countries and some of them are from Brazil. This is how much you get uh, as minimum wage monthly uh, working in Brazil. And yeah, if you if that's where you are, if that's the assumptions that you're working under, then yes, some games actually easily hit minimum wage in Brazil. But even here, only the exceptional ones actually went that far. Success is quite variable depending on where you live or how long it took you to develop the games. This equation, this math is more or less favorable. But we can tweak around those numbers as we want. Very, very few games are actually reaching any of those thresholds. And down here we actually see the average. We can see that the average game in this database sells for $40. So the average game here made $40. This number is a bit misleading. Because of the big spike, the very successful games are pushing the average up. So you actually can't expect to see the average revenue when you sell a Pico 8 game. The reality is much, much lower. In those situations, we actually have to look at the median. 
For those not fluent in the math, the median means that half of the dataset is above it and half of the dataset is below it. So we can see that the median in this case lies at around $8. This is the kind of revenue that you can expect when selling a Pico 8 game. Yeah, those are not great numbers. In fact, I can actually see this is, there's here a small threshold that I included as well. Some developers I were actually talking about, they were really happy when they were able to break even on the Pico 8 purchase, when they were able to get back the money that invested in the Pico 8 program itself. And as you can see, the median is actually even below that. So, hmm, yeah, those are not really great numbers. And this actually mirrors something that I heard a lot when interviewing developers, when asking them, uh, a lot of them, uh, said that selling Pico 8 games is not a great idea. That the strength of Pico 8 is, you know, experimenting and, you know, the creativity and not really creating something that sells very well. But you also have to say this data set is also skewed heavily towards amateurs. A lot of the developers that we have here, they that's basically their first Pico 8 project that they just, you know, put on Ichio and just see what happens. So you might be tempted to set aside some of those developers, for example, maybe the games that made zero sales and just focus on the very experienced developers and to see you know, what an experienced developer is expected to make uh, selling Pico 8 games on Itch.io. But if you do that, you run into a kind of like peculiarity. A lot of the games that make very little money were actually made by quite popular developers, very experienced developers. So for example, here we have, um, if you go through the zero sales, uh, zero revenue games, we see that, oh, hey, there is Bathos by Johan Pates, and there's Golf Sunday by Johan Pates, and there's Polar Panic, Polar Panic. Oh my gosh, there's Breakout Hero by me? Alpine Alpaca just made $2, and it's one of my most favorite Pico 8 games. So obviously there's something more happening here, and I want to tease this out. So I actually color-coded some of the bars to see how the games are being sold. So what you see here is the color of each bar now indicates a different selling strategy. These dark bars that you can see here are a game that I basically called hard paywall, which means the only way for you to play the game is to actually pay for it, to actually download it from Itch.io. The light blue colors here is something I called soft deluxe, which is actually a quite popular way of offering Pico 8 games on Itch.io, I realized. This is basically where you embed the HTML5 in the Itch.io website, so it's actually playable for free in the, in the Itch.io website. But you can just scroll down and then you can actually download um, a standalone version for the desktop, but you have to pay some money for it. And I actually differentiate here between Soft Deluxe and Soft Deluxe name your own price. And then the final category are these kind of like light green and very, very light green uh, colors. These are games that are based on donations or that are just straight out free which means the game is embedded in the website and you can play it for free in the website. And there is a donate button that you can click in to support the game, but you're not, not getting anything from that. Or the game is just like straight out free. There is no button at all involved. And yeah, as you can see, the most financially successful games seem to be using the hard paywall strategy. So the next thing I want to do is to tease out more information out of this data. So let's move on to the next graph. All right, this one is a bit more complicated. So we see a distribution of dots in space. <laughs> on the vertical axis, we still have money, but now on the horizontal axis, we see the views. So we see the views charted against the money the games make. And again, here, as with before, I can actually turn on the colors so we can see the different strategies of the different games color coded. So you see here, these dark dots over here that are going up, uh, up the money graph. These are the successful hard paywall kind of games. You can see the dark dots are tend to rise up because they tend to make the money. And as you can see also that the games that are set to donation or to being free, that they tend to stay quite low on the graph. So they don't do too much uh, revenue, but they tend to go really, really far on the right side. They tend to be very successful in terms of views. And you might ask yourself, wait a minute, where is Poom? Well, Poom is different. Poom is over there. <laughs> I decided to start the graph zoomed in so Poom is out of the picture because if you zoom in that far that Poom is actually visible, then all of the other games, you can see that all of the other games are kind of squished against, against the vertical axis because they're way over there. <laughs> 
yeah, Poom is, as you can see, Poom is, in terms of views, Poom is incredibly successful, even though financially it's just like a little bit more successful than the hard paywall games. And this has to do that the, with the fact that the different sales strategies generally are more or less successful at generating revenue. And you can see this more clearly if we enable the averages. So by clicking on this box, you see like these lines appear. These are averages for the different strategies. And we also have like an average overall. So you see that from this data set, on average, you make $1 per 211 visitors. 211 people have to visit your website for you to make $1 on average. But if you are doing a kind of hard paywall kind of situation where people have to buy your game in order to play it, then your average becomes a lot better. Then only 46 people have to visit your website for you to make $1. Conversely, that stat really tanks when you decide to set your game to donations or if you just give it out for free. In this case, uh, 1,500 people have to visit your website until you make $1. And actually, I have to say, this graph really, really surprised me. I was operating under the assumption that in order to sell a game online, um, the main important thing that you have to focus on are the views. That's not necessarily wrong, but I did not expect the split between the different strategies, between the different um, sales strategies to be so large. And really setting your game to donations is um, a strategy that's really doomed to failure if you expect any kind of revenue from it. As you can see, this slope is so flat. In order for me to reach, like, I don't know, like minimum wage, I would have to make like a million views. Even jumping up from donations to like the soft paywall, for your audience, it's not really that big of a difference, but actually in the revenue it, it creates, it's a huge difference. Now that doesn't mean that the views don't count and actually what we see here with Poom is a good example of that. Yeah, Poom is not using the most efficient monetizing strategy. That wasn't their goal in the first place, but simply by being so incredibly successful in terms of views, they were able to you know, be the most successful game on this list easily outpacing all those games that were trying, you know, uh, with more efficient strategies with the hard paywall strategies. Now, there is a question here that immediately arises when we look at this kind of graph. We see, you know, the dark dots, the hard paywall games being, you know, on this very steep graph, but also not really getting very far down this line. We see that most of the hard paywall games have comparatively few views. Whereas we see that the games that are were set to donation, you know, like Pico Driller here or like Pork Like or My Chance Sweet Buns, they managed to go really, really far down this view track. An obvious question we might ask ourselves here is if setting your game to a hard paywall, if that has some kind of detrimental effect on the amount of views your game receives. I'm gonna actually have to leave this question hanging because we don't actually have the data. We can't really rule this one way or the other. Personally, I don't think it's related. I think it's more a fluke in the data that we have here. We just don't have a lot of people that tried the hard paywall strategy. Plus the data about the donation games is a bit biased here. Um, that's something I'm gonna talk about at the end of the video. For now, uh, I think an important game that I wanna talk about is again, I was talking about Pushamon. Pushamon is kind of quite extraordinary here because it doesn't have a lot of views, but it's the second most successful game in this graph. And in order to take a closer look at this, I've created a third graph. All right, so this is the third graph and I already turned on the colors and I also turned on the averages. This is a very similar graph. We still have the views on the horizontal axis, but this time the vertical axis is no longer money. Now we're looking at uh, sales, the actual payments, the actual individual units being sold. Actually, when we start switching between the second and the third graph, we see that, you know, they are kind of similar. Um, the overall structure is basically the same. We see that in the third graph, everything moves together a little bit because um, the differences caused by different pricing strategies are kind of like being reduced to just the raw sales numbers. And actually what we created here is a graph that shows us the conversion ratio. This is a bit of a technical sales term. The conversion ratio means basically how many of the people that saw your website, how many of those people are turned into customers? How many views are converted into sales? The conversion ratio. 
This is a standard term that you see in the industry, and it allows us to kind of like see how well Pico 8 games are doing compared to other products being sold online. One number that I've heard being thrown around for many years is that, you know, a conversion ratio of 1% is something that just to be expected. If you're doing far less than 1%, then maybe something is wrong. And it's fair enough, you see that a lot of games on this graph are doing far less than 1%. In fact, you know, all the soft deluxe games and in the nations games, you know, the nation games make like 0.01%. And um, the soft deluxe games are making 0.09%. That's to be expected. You know, the game is actually playable for free and just very few people will actually scroll down and purchase the game. There is very little incentives to turn viewers into customers. But looking at the hard paywall games, things are actually getting a lot more interesting. So the average among the hard paywall games is 0.5%. That's still half percent below. But we also see some of the games that we have here actually have a fine conversion ratio. This anonymous game here has 1%. And in fact, Pushamo has 1.5%. Pushamo is doing really well. In order to give us more context to understand how good these numbers are, I actually reached out to some fellow developers to ask them for their conversion ratios. Big shout outs to one of the developers that has been very useful in this, and that is Jake Burkett. He is the developer of a quite successful solitaire game called Regency Solitaire. He is also uh, well known for writing a lot of blog posts about um, selling games and, you know, giving advice on how to sell games. I know him personally from this, you know, special talk, um, GDC talk, that is one of my favorites, um, which is, you know, how to survive in game dev for 11 years without a hit. So this is him basically... Mm, retelling the story of how, you know, he made a living selling games for 11 years now. So yeah, if Jake is getting your numbers, you're getting some good numbers. And yeah, obviously the link to this video is also going to be down a doobly-doo. You should watch it. Going back to our spreadsheet, we can turn on Jake's averages. So there are two lines here. I have to maybe explain what these lines do. 0.9%. That is what Jake achieved with his games on uh, on itch.io and 1.8% is what Jake achieved with his games on Steam. And as you can see, there's at least four games from this hard paywall category, which are basically in the ballpark of those numbers. So yeah, Pushamo is doing really good here, but also we have to also acknowledge Super Mega Bread with even a better conversion ratio, albeit less views. So why does Pushamo have such a great conversion ratio? Well, I think in this case, it's kind of very clear. Pushamo has an amazing website. So yeah, that's something I've been talking about in the last video about how to upload things to itch.io, how important the design of the website is. Well, if you want to see an amazing website, Pushamo is certainly a website to check out. Super Mega Bread is more of a mystery, I have to say. <laughs> I don't know, maybe the name is really funny. <laughs> Super Mega Bread, apparently the kids love it. So why am I bringing this up? Well, I think one sentiment uh, that I've seen um, expressed in a lot of interviews with the developers and, um, you know, sentiment that I heard a lot thrown around when discussing this topic with other Pico 8 developers. One question that comes up is this question whether people will actually be willing to pay for a Pico 8 game if that's something that you can bring people to do. I think there is a fear or a concern among Pico 8 developers to kind of think of, hmm, it has, you know, this very low resolution, it doesn't look really that great, it's not really a big game. Maybe people will see this game and be just not willing to pay money for it. And if you to look at the averages, sure, the averages are not that great, but you know, those few games here, they are have conversion ratios that are comparable to, you know, big boy games on big boy platforms. These are games that people just paid money for, like a, for a normal game. So yeah, it is actually possible to make people pay for a Pico 8 game. In terms of conversion rate, Pico 8 can hold up with bigger engines. Maybe not on average, but we have examples of games achieving this and it's not just one. Moving on to the fourth graph. So this is actually one where I wanted to talk a little bit about the sales price of Pico 8 games. Now again, let me turn on the colors and actually let me turn on the averages here. Okay, this is a simple uh, bar graph again. Money is on the vertical axis again. And um, yeah, this is a simple bar graph showing average sales prices that our projects achieved, you know, when selling games in our database. Uh, I've ordered them from, you know, highest sales prices, highest average sales prices to lowest average sales prices. 
You might think that this is a very similar graph to the first one where you have a huge spike and a long tail, but actually it's not quite um, because this huge spike uh, here at the front is that's actually more of a, um, a noise happening here. Those four games that we have in the front here that were games that received basically just one single payment, but a payment that was very generous and that kind of pushed the average price very high. Otherwise, we get like this quite linear slope. Now, you might notice this dot here. This dot is actually the price that the developer asked for. So we see obviously that most of the time the developer asked for less money than they received. That's to be expected as a general rule on issue, you can always pay more than the developer asked for. There are some times where the dot is actually above the achieved uh, average sales price and that is the result of, you know, discounts and sales and so forth or the price changing and so forth. Sometimes you will discount the game and you will get a lot of sales from that and this will push the average down. But the most important part here is this year, the average sale and the average price. So the average price is the average asking price the developer set, you know, like I'm going to sell my game for X. And the average sale is the average sales price, the average sales price that those games achieved when they're actually sold. Uh, basically what people were willing to pay for the Pico 8 games. As you can see, the average asking price is $2.50, but the average sales price is $4 which suggests to me that Pico 8 games are severely underpriced. As I said, you would expect the average sales price to be a bit higher than the asking price, but you wouldn't expect the average sales price to be twice, almost twice the number. And yes, I did my due diligence here and I actually excluded the games that are priced at zero or, you know, name your own price from this calculation. So this is really just, you know, the average price from the games that actually have a price. And yeah, sure, generous donations should push the average sales price up, but they also wouldn't be that frequent. So in the long run, you know, things would average out. And yeah, if you look at something um, that has a lot of sales, like Poom here, which was set to name your own price, over a long period of time, it kind of approaches $4. And also this is in line with something that we see generally across the industry, generally, especially if you're a small independent developer, you tend to undervalue your game. You tend to sell it for a lower price than you should be selling it for. So if there is a takeaway from this data set is that I think generally as a Pico 8 developer, you should be selling your games for around $4. And this is the kind of situation that you actually want to be higher, maybe a little bit than you should be, because it's always possible to go down. You can make a sale or you can make you know, a permanent sale. You can permanently crank down the price, but cranking up the price doesn't feel so great. And let me drill down here a little bit because I think this also touches a very important point that may be at the core of a lot of the things that we see here. Again, as I said, that's something that independent developers are generally struggling with. And this is something I heard about from a lot of the developers when I interviewed them for uh, this data collection. There is a real pressure here to engage a kind of race to the bottom. We might think we need to go lower with the price in order to stay competitive. If there are all those great games out there that are so awesome and they're priced at a certain number, then I feel the pressure with my game that is just not that great to go lower in order to stay competitive. So here's a tweet from Mike Rose from the indie publisher No More Robots, and I will talk about him a bit later. Earlier this year, he tweeted, It's still crazy to me that AAA is pushing for a £10 price hike across the board, yet indie studios constantly feel pressured to reduce their prices. This indie title is not worth the £10 I paid for, said the gamer, while simultaneously dropping £70 on a derivative AAA. Now that pressure that Mike is talking about may be real. It may also be something that we just internalized. Regardless, we feel the need to keep going lower and lower. We want to be the good diff. We want to stay humble. There is a different sentiment that is not really about the price, but I think it belongs in here because it's kind of like the flip side of the same equation. There is also a pressure to engage a different kind of race, and that is the race to kind of like maximize the amount of content, the scope of your game, to make it bigger and grander to offer more value for the money, and Pico 8 often gets in the way with that. The thing with the other engines is that they don't have limitations like Pico 8, so the games can have more scope, polishing, and graphics with more resolution. In other words, the games will give more to people for their money. If you find yourself in a situation where the game is not selling as well as you thought it would, it's an obvious thing to seek the problem with the game, to maybe seek for ways in which you can increase its value. And yeah, both of these sentiments are trying to fix this problem in a brute force kind of way. 
And I understand that sentiment because I frequently found myself thinking along similar lines. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to actually make the survey. I wanted to have numbers. I wanted to see the evidence. I want to make sure that we are operating now with real actual data and not just basing things on our gut feelings. I don't think there's a single game in this data set where lowering the price would somehow result in better sales. It's just not the thing that is limiting the sales in this data. And I think I can prove it. So in this graph, we can actually sort those, um, those values here by a different metric, and we can sort them according to the number of payments, the actual sales. So now on the left side, we see the games that have been sold a lot of times. And on the right side, we see the games that have been sold just a few times. So here, you know, on the very far right, we have games with just one payment. On the very far right, we have Poom with 172 payments. And as you can see, we don't really see a good correlation here. It's not like the cheap games are on the left side and expensive games are on the right side. Sure, we have some tall graphs here, but they don't actually matter. What I'm looking at here are the dots. As you can see, the dots are the asking price and the games with a low asking price aren't necessary further down left. In fact, we have some prominent examples of games on the left that have actually pretty high asking price. So yeah, there's just no good correlation between a low price and sales numbers. It's not the thing that's limiting the sales. And I also don't think PicoA's restrictions are massively limiting the sales. In fact, I've heard from a lot of developers who tried to develop games in different engines and they saw similar sales numbers. And in fact, you can see some of the data here. So let's go back to the third graph here. And there's actually a button here. You have a, that button in every graph, uh, which enables non Pico 8 entries. These are actually punk cake games from Trustful Dog. If you don't know about them, it's basically two famous Pico 8 developers, Benjamin and Remy, and they got together and uh, turned their Pico 8 projects into, you know, bigger games with, you know, bigger engines. And they also created Patreon and, you know, made a huge marketing push. And yeah, they're doing really well. I'm really happy about this. Metavex did really well. And the Rats then is also seems to be going really well. But the big successes is not the thing I want you to focus on. Instead, I want you to look at their first game that they ever released, which is Anticrypt, which has a conversion ratio, which is comparable to the Pico 8 games we looked at before. Total revenue is also somewhere among, you know, the revenue that you saw from the other successful Pico 8 games. And so in this case, switching to a non Pico 8 game engine and, and making the game bigger didn't actually result in an exceptional success compared to Pico 8 games. But there's actually another game that's hidden in the data set. If you scroll all the way down here, yeah, here, there we go. Here's an anonymous dev that also shared some sales from a non Pico 8 game that they also had on the same platform. As you can see, the sales are not great. They are comparable to the Pico 8 games they made. The only difference is that this game took a year to develop, whereas the Pico 8 games went a lot faster. What I'm saying here, switching to a bigger engine, making the game bigger, doesn't necessarily result in a huge success. And again, this is not an isolated case. I've heard other developers reporting similar results. So the takeaway here is that we need to make sure when we're tuning something about this whole process, that the dial that we're turning here, that this is actually something that's connected to the problem that we're trying to solve. For the vast majority of the games in this data set, the biggest problem that is limiting sales is actually just the page views. Increasing the value proposition, giving people more for the money, if anything, is a way to increase sales among the people who already visited your site. It's a way to increase the conversion ratio. And even then, I would probably argue that there are better ways of increasing conversion ratio than a better value proposition. In any case, a better value proposition is not really a way to drive traffic to your game. It's not a way to increase your views. That is more of a communication problem. It's a marketing problem. Lowering the price is not the answer here. Now, as you can see, this can be a bit of a kind of worms, and we're probably going back to it, this in a future video. For now, let me finish this up with a related graph. This is the graph I call the unfair graph. And it's an unfair graph because it is a bit of an apples to oranges comparison. First of all, this graph, again, still has poom on it, but it's, <laughs> it's way over here. It's way bigger than the rest. So I decided to zoom a little bit so we can see the rest. This graph is trying to measure a value that for me as a developer is actually quite important. It's trying to measure how many people actually played a game. For the games that are embedded in the browser, you often have like this browser play number, this basic number of people that clicked on play on the game and, you know, just tried it out in the browser. And this is the unfair part for the games that are not embedded in the browser. We can't take a browser place number. We have to use a different number as a substitute. Uh, so in this graph, we are taking the download number, the number of times that people downloaded the game on their computer. 
And again, this is kind of like a bit of an apples to oranges comparison because clicking on a thing on a browser is just not the same thing as downloading and paying for something. That's just a completely different process. And just because I click on something doesn't mean I actually engage with it, you know? And actually we can make this a little bit, there's an extra unfair button where we aren't taking the download numbers, but we are actually taking the actual purchases, the payments, the actual number of people that actually paid for this game. Because the thing is a lot of people who are selling the games through a hard paywall model, they actually participated in the you know big itch.io bundles where you know millions of, game of bundles were being sold and they got quite a lot of downloads from those bundles. I'm not really sure how those downloads are being interpreted, if that's actually people who played the game or not, it's kind of hard to tell. Well, in any case, you can actually make it extra unfair and not take their downloads in consideration, but just the actual payments. And as you can see, if you do that, the dark games basically disappear from this graph. They are so minuscule compared to the free and the donation type kind of games and, you know, some of the soft deluxes that they're basically no longer visible anymore because there's just so few people that actually played those games in this metric. So yeah, Curse of the Lich King, for example, here played by 12,000 people compared to, you know, here's Pushamo, the second best selling game on this list. And it had just 86 purchases, just potentially just 86 people playing your game. And funny thing, you can also actually enable the punk cake games that we just saw that is very, very successful punk cake games. And they also disappear here on this graph. They're just like, you know, just 300 people played the insanely successful Metavax game. And this is something I was talking about in the beginning. There's different ways of measuring success. There's different metrics by which we can measure how successful a certain game is. There's different things that you might value as a developer that are important for your game. Is it really worth it if you get 100 bucks more if as a result you will lose thousands of potential plays on your games? And this goes in line with this whole problem that I talked about in the beginning, that the approaching this whole question with this intent of trying to sell a game seems uh, at first glance so tone deaf for many people already in Pico 8 community. The Pico 8 community is driven by people, you know, wanting to share the creations, sharing them on Splore, learning from each other, downloading each other's code and looking at it. And coming into this space and trying to sell a game seems a bit dissonant. And this makes it really hard for people who try to sell those games on Itch.io to find a place for them to even to exist. Earlier, I was talking about how indie devs underprice their games, how we compare ourselves to other games and want to undercut them. Well, guess what this line of reasoning does to you when the competition is free? I think that if game devs want to break even or make money, they should not sell Pico 8 games. I think with all the free Pico 8 cards available on the website and in the engine itself, you can stay entertained for weeks on end playing games that are quite frankly insanely polished and so awesome. There is this clash between the two approaches that resolves itself in kind of like really problematic ways. I am giving away some of my games for free because I want people to learn from them and because I want to reach a widest possible audience because this is important for me. But as a result, a lot of people coming into the space and maybe trying to, you know, sell their work are struggling to find value in their work. And here I wanted to share with you a very poignant quote by Brendan Keogh, which I, I thought was, was really interesting. When talking about games, he said, Whenever or not they are made in Pico 8 is almost beside the point. If it took a lot of work, it should cost money. I don't want to further contribute to the devaluing of game labor by putting my stuff out for free just because I don't need the money. Even the little $1 paywall at least helps normalize that if you're playing someone's game, they deserve some of your money. So yet for me, this was like kind of like this aha moment, realizing that I have a certain responsibility, especially as somebody who is very you know, prominent in this space. Ideally, what I want to have is a way for these two approaches to coexist. We would love to have a lot of people who are just sharing their work and, you know, contributing, learning from each other. But we also should find ways to cherish and appreciate people who come in here and who want to see a return on their labor. We should create a space for them to exist as well. This is not something that will be resolved overnight, and I think it's worth discussing this further in the community as we move on. But for me personally, the next step is actually quite easy. I was surprised at how badly donation games are doing uh, compared to even something like Soft Deluxe. And again, from a player's perspective, there's almost no difference between the two. In fact, in many ways, the Soft Deluxe actually ends up being more user-friendly. Something that I notice is that on a lot of my games, people are actually asking for a downloadable version. So this might be actually a good opportunity to put a price on my work. And yeah, in the future, I'm actually considering maybe trying 
a hard paywall kind of game. It feels like there's a lot of potential here that we haven't explored yet as a community. There's just not a lot of games in here. Now, as we finish up, I wanted to add some disclaimers and you know caveats to all this. And this last graph is actually a good place to start. When looking at this graph, it seems like donation games are you know the ticket to high view numbers, but that's actually not the case. That's actually a bias in the data set. As I said at the beginning, I was actually looking for paid games. So any donation type of games and any free type of games are coincidental. There are basically numbers that I just had because I had them or numbers that I got from developers who just had also donation games next to paid games. So when talking about free or donation games, this is actually not a representative collection. And also in general, like statistically, this data set is relatively small. There's not a lot of games in here. So this is subject to, you know, all sorts of, you know, tricky biases or even like just like random noise. And another problem that I've encountered here that sometimes the data is kind of like a bit nonsensical. And that's because, you know, the way people sell those games over time changes. So a game might start as a hard paywall, but then be turned into a free game. And suddenly you have payments on a free game, even though there is no button to actually buy this game. So yeah, don't necessarily trust those numbers too much. And actually, I'm also covering just the numbers on itch because they were quite easy to compare. Something I'm not discussing is, you know, for example, some games are on Steam. Some games got some exclusive deals. Cool Math Games is apparently sometimes featuring Pico 8 games. You can maybe negotiate a deal with them. Apparently, it makes a huge difference. Cool Math Games. Who knew? So this brings me actually to the topic. It might be worthwhile putting those numbers that we just had. It might be worthwhile putting those numbers in context and compare them maybe a little bit to other ways in which we can sell games or even other types of culture on the internet. Are those numbers really that bad compared to other things that we can do? So this is, for example, a really good talk I would recommend from Mike Rose. It's called Let's Be Realistic, a deep dive into how games are selling on Steam. This is a three-year-old video at this point. And it breaks down some basic sales numbers that you can expect selling games on Steam right now. At this point, there is over 40 games coming out on Steam every day. In 2018, an average game on Steam sold just 50 copies. It made $250 in revenue. And those numbers are all medians, not the means, right? Now it's 2021 and the numbers are even lower. I would not be surprised if the current numbers for Steam are actually not far away from the numbers that we just seen here. Something to keep in mind is that Steam also, additionally, uh, it costs $100 to even put up a game on Steam. So you already you know $100 negative when you before you started selling a single game. Steam also takes a 30% cut. And also, if you want to actually get money from Steam, you actually have to at least have made $100. So you kind of have to make like $260 before you see any money, which if you consider that, you know, the average is... $250, it's, woof, that's not looking really great. A lot of developers putting their games on Steam are actually paying Steam. And this is actually one of the reasons why Steam might not actually end up being such an attractive place to put up your PQ8 game on. And yeah, this is totally a video that you have to watch and link will be down in the doobly-doo for this as well. Another thing that just recently happened is the big Twitch leak where we got to look at the Twitch numbers, seeing how much money streamers are making. And something that was like really sobering was to look at, you know, what percentage of streamers are actually making any money. You need to be in the top 0.015% of all streamers to make the median US household income from direct Twitch streaming revenue. From the over 8 million people that are streaming on Twitch, just like a meager 1,000 people are making an average income. Millions of people are giving away labor for free. Yikes! And if you thought that was really bad, I will link you to this documentary by People Make Games. It's a deep dive into the Roblox ecosystem, how the company that owns Roblox is making money and the kind of shady practices they're using to exploit people who are using their platform. This is vile stuff that, as a game developer, really makes my blood boil. They lure kids in, making it seem like you can be the next you know, game design superstar, but they then use all these shady tricks to withhold the revenue. Even if you are one of the few developers who makes any kind of money in Roblox, there's a good chance that you know, money will be trapped forever in this system, that you will never actually see the money that you've earned. Compared to all these grimdark situations, the numbers that we arrived here are actually okay. This is just what selling things on the internet is like today. It actually seems a lot more relaxed. So what does this mean? Can you sell a Pico 8 game? 
Yes, no, maybe. What I think personally, well, obviously the numbers don't really look that great, but I think there might be like two general strategies that you could take and, you know, try to give it a shot. Strategy number one is to have a knockout page and to also do a ton of marketing. As we already discussed, games like Pushomo have actually pretty fair conversion ratio. So if you make a hard paywall game like this and also invest in like a lot of marketing and try to get the word out, try to get as much views as possible, then you might actually see some fair revenue from this. And the second way in which I think you can successfully sell a Pico 8 game is to figure out a way to break out of the Pico 8 bubble. Yeah, so this is why I think the Poom example is so interesting because as you saw in so many graphs, I had to kind of like exclude Poom because it was just breaking the graph because it made all of the games, all of the other games seem minuscule of the numbers of the other games seem minuscule. And the main important difference is just the raw view numbers. Poom just has a lot of views. You see all of the other games in our statistics be all clustered around, you know, in this little place here, which I would call the Pico 8 bubble. These are the kind of views that I think you can expect if you, you know share your game in Pico 8 spaces, if you post it on the Discord, if you post it on Lexalofl, if you post it, you know, on the hashtag Pico 8, if you just post it on itch and then you get some audience from itch itself. What Poom was able to do, I think, is able to reach an audience outside of the Pico 8 space. The developers of Poom found a way in which, you know, people outside of the Pico 8 sphere talk about it. People from regular gaming websites wrote articles about this. When you have this huge amount number of views, it's fairly easy to monetize it. Frederick and Parent Cactus weren't actually like interested in generating any revenue, but it could have easily done so by changing this from a name your own price to like a fixed deluxe. And actually, you might have heard about this one, right? Well, I think this is another example of a project that broke out of the Pico 8 bubble. I talked to Johan, but he said he wanted to publish and discuss, you know, the numbers, the sales numbers of PicoCat on his own, on his own blog. And I think that's a good idea. Let's just go back to PicoCat when those numbers are public. In any case, figuring a way in which non-Pico8 people discuss your Pico8 project might be also a way to sell a Pico8 project. These two strategies have two things in common. Number one, the views are the key. This is the one thing that really limits the sales, just the number of views. And number two, you have to know what you're doing. You cannot expect to just upload your game to Itch.io and see the money flooding in. This is just not how it works these days. And it doesn't really matter if we're talking about Pico 8 or any kind of game engine. This is just not how you sell games in 2021. And so there's different ways of looking at this. You can look at those numbers and you can see, you know, that even the most successful games aren't getting anywhere. And yeah, that's actually kind of a sobering situation here. With a lot of projects on here, I actually expected them to have made more money than they actually did. But on the other hand, I actually see some potential here. There are some surprises here as well. I do see some potential for more experiments in trying to explore the space and see what's possible with Pico 8. As I said in my Isoken video, finishing a game is not the end of it. After you finish the game and you release it to the public, that's a whole new ball game. And I think we as Pico 8 community, we have to learn this ball game for our engine. So in the future, I would love to see more projects doing more experiments in this space. If you want to go out there and try something, you have my support. And so this is the end of the video. This data obviously will be available to you. There's a link to the spreadsheets down in doobly-doo, and there's also going to be a link to this visualization so you can play around and experiment on your own. Let me know in the comment sections. Do you have some interesting insights? Do you agree or disagree with my interpretations? Do you have your own ideas of how to answer this question? At this point, I would also extend a huge, huge thank you to all of the developers that participated in this project. It's not easy to expose yourself like this, but by doing so, you did a huge service to the community. And if you guys out there also want to thank those developers, there's no better way than actually just buying their games. Aside from the anonymous entries, all of those data points here are actually clickable. And if there's something that strikes your fancy, just give it a go. But there is an even better way. Brooke from Pushamo got a bunch of the devs from this database together and they are launching the Pico 8 Premium Bundle. So you can support all of those games in one go and you can check out some of the gems you've been missing out on. It looks like it even has support from Zep himself. So yeah, this should be great. The bundle should launch at the same time as the video drops. So check out the link in the doobly-doo. 
I have to say this has been a huge undertaking. This took a better part of two months to, you know, to assemble. And actually I've been recording this video here over three hours now because there's just so much to discuss, so much data to process. So yeah, if you appreciate this work and you found this data useful, I have a coffee page set up where you can make a small contribution or even become a monthly subscriber where you can fuel more crazy projects like this one. And as it's always the case with those Patreon kind of like systems, there's always some perks involved. So for example, this month you can actually get your hands on the source code of this visualization and you can maybe, you know, mod it so you can create your own graphs and your own analysis of this data based on my code, which may or may not be spaghetti. So this is it guys. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.